Good afternoon. It's Thursday, the 9th of March 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, and uh, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. I think I might have missed something there. I don't think so. OK, that's good. Well, uh, the good news is that the weather's improved in Plymouth. The daffodils are out, so we think spring is in the air. That's the good news. Um, but you've been looking closely at um, our illustrious leader, Theresa May. Well, Theresa May, of course, uh, has been ac right across the uh, mainstream media uh, late yesterday and today uh, because of her behaviour at Prime Minister's questions yesterday, and particularly the laugh. Um, so I just wanted to sort of draw um, some parallels here uh, between uh, the behaviour of uh, two of the world's great leaders, uh, you know, and is there any coincidence? I don't know. It's, it's pretty scary, I think, is the correct expression for that. And obviously, Hillary Clinton was ill. There was no question about that in the lead up to the American elections. Um, I looked at the laughter there um, from Theresa May and you say this is bizarre because what they're really discussing or what they were discussing in the House was the demise of the United Kingdom, where they were giggling and chuck chuckling and swapping jokes as if it was some sort of drunken reunion. I don't think I can be more scathing, but I could, but I'm not allowed to use the language. No, well, we'll come on to that later on in the programme. But, uh, well, Justin, budget day yesterday. Uh, budget day yesterday. Justin Walker from the British uh, Constitution Group attended and uh, with a very small group of British Constitution Group supporters. Uh, small numbers did the job, though, because they took with them 800 leaflets spelling out why the government's claim that there is no money is a complete lie. Uh, so the leaflets were challenging MPs, um, Corbyn in particular, because he's the man who signed the early day motion for the Bradbury Pound. And now suddenly he doesn't even want to talk about that uh, signature he put on the piece of paper. So what took place? Well, Justin said it was very quiet initially. And then 400 ladies turned up from uh, WASPI. So these are uh, ladies who are campaigning for uh, pension rights. And uh, very quickly, their numbers swelled to a thousand. And uh, Justin said in no time at all, every single leaflet had gone with lots of these ladies asking very good questions about the banking system, how money was created, and the overwhelming comment was, we never knew this. Uh, a little while later, uh, Paddy Ashdown appeared, who is uh, connected with this uh, movement. Uh, he started to give a little speech to a group of the ladies, whereupon they used the information on the, the handout from the British Constitution Group to ask him questions. Uh, it did not take long before he put his hands up and literally said, I surrender. I don't know the answer to these questions. So we think for a small group of British Constitution Group people, um, a pretty good result achieved. Of course, the media there in some numbers, um, some of them totally disinterested in anything that was, um, uh, what's the word, outside their frame of reference. Uh, but some of them were indeed interested. So I, I think that the knowledge is beginning to spread, Mike. Yes. Well, let's look at the budget itself. Uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Philip Hammond stealing from the poor to give to the rich, I guess you could say. Uh, the noise in the media over his uh, decision to change national insurance payment for self-employed people. Absolutely overpowering anything else that was going on within the budget. Um, so the question is, what is that noise hiding? Um, well, let's not mention the disabled because uh, that might be controversial. He, of course, cut corporation tax by £6 billion, but that didn't change the fact that as of next week, disabled people will have uh, £30, per, 30 pounds per, per week taken away from them uh, because 12 months ago, uh, the Conservative government uh, cut personal independence payments in a bid to save uh, £4.4 billion for the Treasury. Um, so Hammond had this to say this morning, it's only right and fair that we should take a small step to closing the gap between the treatment of employed and self-employed people, um, because it's all about fairness. And I'm sure everyone will agree with me that uh, cuts to personal independent, uh, independence payments for disabled people, while at the same time cutting corporation tax for, co for large corporations is extremely fair, Brian. Um, but uh, what else is going on? Well, foreign aid will continue to be dished out. Uh, and will actually increase uh, 
by £300 million. So Priti Patel, very happy about that. Uh, she didn't, of course, say what I have on the screen there, uh, but that is the point. Uh, the money makes Priti Patel very happy because she can foment all kinds of war uh, with the kind of budget that she's got. What is that budget? Well, she ha now has over £16 billion to play with between now and 2020. Um, and, uh, well, the other thing that uh, Hammond was talking about was uh, the Midlands engine strategy because he launched that yesterday as well on the back of the budget. Uh, now, Hammond had said that uh, we need that he needed £2 billion for social care, uh, and that had to come for, from somewhere, so he's decided to target the self-employed for that. But in fact, uh, he's putting a whole pot of money into this kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, of course, what is this about? It's about the breakup of the country into regions. This is uh, EU policy in action, um, but of course, British government not pursuing EU policy, Brian, because we're coming out of Brexit and we're coming out of the EU? Uh, well, that's what the uh, British government is saying, Mike. But of course, behind the scenes, we are being seriously integrated into the EU, in particular with defence. Right. So what's he talking about? Significant investment in skills, connectivity and local growth. Um, so he's putting a veneer on this. Um, he's going to invest £392 million in the Midlands from the local growth fund. And that cash is apparently going to uh, support innovative projects, including creating a global hub for space technology in Leicester, because you can do a whole lot with 300 million. I mean, 300 million is nothing for sp towards space technology, so they're not really taking this seriously. So what is this really about? It's about breaking up the country. It's about their uh, big society agenda. We're going to have more to say about that today. Um, 20 million pounds in the Midlands skill, Skills Challenge, 4 million to support the operation of the Midlands Engine Partnership, whatever that is. I'm sure uh, there's no common purpose involvement in that at all. Uh, and uh, he said that the Midlands Engine Strategy is an important milestone setting out the concrete actions that they're taking. Um, so uh, this is all about setting out, enhancing the UK's position as a world leader. It's all about global Britain. Well, who else is pushing this policy? Uh, well, of course, it's the likes of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Uh, and all the usual civil society organisations pushing forward with the big society agenda. And that's part and parcel of what this is. And uh, I think we need to encourage all of our viewers and listeners to research these change agent uh, charities and trusts like Joseph Roundtree. Um, they are getting huge amounts of money. They are completely political in what they do. They claim they're independent. Uh, but if you follow the money streams through, these are controlled change agent organisations. And we're going to be commenting in a minute about the links into big society. Um, another thing that he said was that uh, today, yesterday, of course, uh, to enhance the UK's position as a world leader in science and innovation, I'm allocating £300 million of the fund to support the brightest and best research talent, including fellowships focused on STEM projects. Now, this, of course, is uh, science, technology engineering and mathematics. And uh, I've been wondering for quite some time why the government is so keen to push STEM, um, because this is the type of thing that actually uh, many, many people would be calling for, but it's unlikely to be something, in my opinion, that the government would be promoting unless there's something else going on in the background. Um, so uh, should we be investing in STEM? Uh, of course, we should be investing in this type of education. Uh, but uh, the investment as we've pointed out here, is almost non-existent. So there must be something else going on here. I mean, if we take the infrastructure pipeline as an example, there are almost no fully funded projects and there was no great new announcements in the budget yesterday for uh, infrastructure, pipe, uh, infrastructure pipeline projects. Um, so the £300 million is going to turn Leicester into a global hub for space technology. That's laughable. Uh, and uh, if we compare what Britain is doing to what China is doing, for example, uh, with the Silk Road, Road projects, um, then we can only say that this is just veneer. Um, but let's look at who else is promoting STEM. It is, of course, Common Purpose. Uh, 3350, the action starts now, and we look on down through that. They're running a, a programme called U Growth, uh, an educational programme that encourages STEM students to work uh, with on sorry in the renewable sector uh, and also to uh, mentor younger students so this is all about this is something that common purpose is driving the government is driving it uh, what is it about it's about networks they they're creating networks they're drawing more and more people into common purpose style networks in different 
uh, different sectors, but it's not about actually driving a policy of uh, development uh, engineering. Uh, we're just not seeing the, the government policy, you know, on a, on a broader scale than, than just mere words. I think the other thing we can, we can uh, highlight is, of course, this is not a budget which is about jobs, manufacturing, engineering, production. Uh, this has got an immensely strong socio uh, part to it. So this is social engineering being drifted in through a budget which should be looking after people's welfare. Have they got enough jobs? What's the quality of the work? Are they earning enough? That's all pushed to one side. What we've got is a... Um, a flow through the budget, which is social engineering. Now, we've, um, we've got uh, Ian Crane in the wings, and uh, perhaps it's now time to bring Ian in. Uh, Ian, good morning. I understand you're in a very nice location, Harwood House Hotel in Buckinghamshire, which is going to be the uh, location for your Aviate event. It is indeed. It's a, it's a beautiful day here, and... Um, I have to say it, uh, the surroundings are somewhat more conducive than uh, being on the front line of the anti-fracking campaign in, in Lancashire, as I was uh, yesterday. But yeah, this is uh, the AV8 venue. It's a stunning location here in, um, in Buckinghamshire, about 10 miles from uh, Milton Keynes. And, and what's uh, interesting, Brian, is listening to the comments that you guys were making uh, just now about what is unfolding in the UK and, uh, and Jeremy Hunt's uh, budget yesterday. You know, a lot of the subjects that are discussed at AV events, um, unfortunately, are now you know, coming into manifestation. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, no, I don't think any of the speakers claims to have any special insight, but you know, they do research and they do read the scripts. And you know, I'm just thinking of uh, three presentations from AV7 that have um, very much uh, come into being, and that was, you know, Patrick Henningsen's presentation looking at uh, the role of the media in creating effectively what we now regard as uh, as the fake news and of course Vanessa Beely's uh, stunning presentation on um, on the white helmets and I think the the wider realization over the past 12 months of the role of the white helmets has sort of come into uh, you know the wider consciousness and then uh, you know my own presentation which was uh, you know a month before the EU referendum uh, where effectively I stated that you know there was a distinct probability that the result would be to take us out of the EU um, and then to go through the systemic and systematic destruction of the UK as a nation state. And, you know, everything I've just heard you guys talking about, that's now coming into play. Uh, well, totally agree with that. Ian. And uh, particularly the point that we're just now seeing people from very different backgrounds, some of them professional, some of them non-professional, some of them artistic, some of them manufacturing, but they're all beginning to realise that something's wrong. And what I found very encouraging is, is when you get these mixed groups of people together, they talk, they exchange ideas, uh, but they're all reinforcing the fact that they can see that there's something very wrong in the country. And maybe one of the um, biggest themes that uh, they recognise is that we're seeing an increasingly aggressive clampdown on society. In fact, some people who've come back to UK after being away for years, expats, are saying that within a few months they realise that Britain has completely changed from the country they uh, remember. And they now see Britain as an increasingly draconian, threatening uh, sort of aggressive society. So, um, yes, this business that when you bring people together to discuss in groups, the truth seems to come to the surface. And I'll just pop up on screen your Facebook page so that people can go for details of AV8. And uh, this is the, uh, the part for tickets for AV8. Now, at the time I took the screenshot, there were 40 tickets left. Uh, what, how are you doing at the moment on ticket sales for that? Well, there's certainly less than 40 now, um, but I think we still have uh, somewhere in the region of about 30, 32. Um, and uh, I, those people who have booked and haven't reserved their room yet, if they're watching, I would encourage them to do so. Uh, but I will be chasing up on that. But it, this looks like being an absolute full house. We've got the whole hotel booked. And, um, you know, the conference is really, as you say, just a catalyst to bring like minded people together. And, you know, the thing that um, really fascinates me is that at AV8 we have people from right across the social, the political, 
the philosophical and the religi religious spectrum. And as you have rightly identified, Brian, and I know it's the same at, uh, at your events, that you know what is bringing people together and uniting people is this realization that, to put it mildly, something isn't right. Yes, seriously wrong, in fact. Now, we are going to be moving on to um, really the clampdown of the state. But uh, what you've got to tell us today is an extremely interesting court case that took place recently with Quadrilla. And this is to do, if I've got this cor um, correct, this is, uh, this is a clampdown or an attempt to clamp down on demonstrations and free speech by Quadrilla. But it wasn't successful. Tell us about the court case. Well, it's, I think it, it's actually far more uh, pernicious than perhaps uh, most people uh, realise. And what happened is that there was a, a big event at um, uh, Preston New Road, just on the outskirts of Blackpool, a couple of weeks ago. And, and I caught wind of the uh, prospect that there would be a, an invasion of the Quadrilla well site, the construction of the well site there. And I, I suspected that this was a contrived event. And so I actually put warning out that, you know, any invasion of the field on Saturday, February 25th, would play straight into Quadrilla's hands and enable them to go back to the courts to get an injunction on the, uh, the field that, where they're drilling. And this was actually an injunction that was put in place some two and a half years ago, but expired in October. And uh, obviously, any invasion was going to give them exactly the vehicle that they needed to go get the injunction restored. And that's exactly what occurred. And in fact, last Thursday, uh, notices were posted all around the perimeter of the um, Quadrilla site. And it was a, a really thick bundle of papers. I mean, it, uh, you know, it had to have been sort of half a ream. So we're talking 250 plus pages in the bundles that they had attached to the fence. And obviously their intention was that, or their hope was that nobody would actually read them. Um, but fortunately, uh, a number of people did take some time to read them. And I actually left Devon uh, last um, Friday evening to drive back to the north. And I was just north of Exeter when I got a call from somebody who had been plowing through this documentation. And they, they said, Ian, this is an attempt to establish free speech zones. It's an attempt to limit protest to a penned area that's actually off the road, behind a hedge, where nobody can see what's going on. And I said, well, you know, if you're right, then obviously this has to be challenged, because if that goes through and is just rubber stamped, it will set a horrendous precedent. So I spoke to a couple of other people, asked them to check the paperwork. They all said the same. Uh, I didn't actually get to see the full paperwork myself until I picked up a set on a Sunday afternoon. But with a team of people, a small team, about half a dozen or so, uh, we worked through the weekend to put a case together to challenge this attempt to establish the protest pen, the free speech zone. And uh, we, obviously in that short time, we couldn't get any um, le legal counsel. We couldn't find anybody from the legal profession to represent us. But actually that, <laughs> funnily enough, actually worked in our favor. So I went back into court in what is now becoming very familiar to me as a litigant in person. And the judge agreed to allow me to uh, present my case. Actually, I was trying to get an adjournment of 28 days uh, to uh, enable me to get proper legal counsel to present a, a fuller case. But that said, the judge absolutely understood what it was that I was objecting to, because I made the observation that you know, it was very difficult, in fact, perhaps impossible to contest the application to restore the original injunction because of the invasion. So I wasn't contesting that. What I was contesting was this whole um, uh, uh, drive to establish out of sight protest pens well away from the actual location and well away from the public. And of course, another part of this was to prevent public scrutiny of Quadrilla. And of course, Quadrilla, along with all the other companies that are part of the unconventional gas agenda, i.e. the fracking agenda, their track record is, is somewhat less than uh, perfect. And that's uh, a massive understatement. So uh, eventually, uh, as the judge realized, you know, what was at stake here, and although he denied my application to uh, establish a 28-day adjournment, which I told him I would appeal, 
uh, on the basis of the fundamental importance of this issue. But he understood, he latched onto it, and by the end of the day, he uh, um, ruled um, that basically he would agree to the injunction being restored, but he rejected the application to establish the protest zone. So this is a, a seminal ruling because what was being attempted here surreptitiously, and I don't believe for one minute that this is the brainchild of Quadrilla, they're not that smart, this was something that was being pushed um, from either a uh, police commissioner level and Amanda Webster, who's the assistant police commissioner in Lancashire, has a track record of, as she calls herself, protest busting. Um, but there's a distinct probability that this came from an even higher level, um, you know, from central government, as they are desperate to find ways to curtail the increasing public opposition to their unconventional gas, i.e. fracking agenda. So as of Tuesday morning, had we not challenged that case in the Manchester courts, not only uh, would there have been protest pens established, they would have been built overnight, and people would have been forced off the road into the protest pen, but it would have established an absolutely seminal precedent whereby basically anyone who uh, fears public opinion or public opinion that is uh, you know, different from their own agenda could have applied to the courts and then used this precedent to establish these protest pens, these free speech zones. So fortunately, getting it overturned, and I have to say that I was very, very impressed with Judge Rayner's handling. I mean, he explored every possible avenue from both arguments, Quadrilla's arguments and our arguments. And uh, when his ruling at the end of the day, in my opinion, was absolutely right. And, and once again, the judiciary have upheld that fundamental freedom, i.e. the right, the, what is uh, embedded in the European uh, Human Rights Convention, Articles 10 and 11, the fundamental right to assembly and the fundamental right to free expression. And of course, Treason May and uh, her cohorts are desperate to undermine the European uh, Human Rights Convention and to establish their own Bill of Rights. But of course, that Bill of Rights is a total misnomer because actually it will be a bill of removal of rights. So what we have seen over the last few days is a massive attempt by the corporatist state to limit uh, freedom of expression, to limit uh, protest. And what we have seen at Preston Road over the last couple of days is an increase in the level of police aggression. And, and certainly last night um, was a primer face example of that. And if people go to my Facebook page or the Fracking Nightmare Facebook page, they'll see my live stream video, which only runs for about 25 minutes. And what you'll see is the whole tone of policing change. And this was gratuitous aggression. It was totally unnecessary. Effectively, you know, the protest for the day was over and these level one tactical assault unit, uh, sorry, tactical aid units, the TAU, you know, had been held back. They sat in their vans through the day and then they waited until, you know, the vast majority of people had, had gone home. And then they decided, as a, I guess, as an exercise, a training exercise, just to see how much the uh, testosterone could be brought into play and uh, literally push people up the road. I was shirt fronted up the road for a significant chunk of the way. Uh, a gentleman uh, not much younger than me, but standing next to me, had his phone knocked out of his hand as he was filming. And uh, as he went to grab his phone, he was pushed to, pushed to the floor. Uh, uh, we've subsequently learned that he's broken his wrist. And uh, well, people can see the video for themselves and they can make up their own minds. But my point is that it was totally gratuitous. And, and it, the primary purpose, the sole purpose of this was to be intimidatory, to try to discourage people from participating in a uh, peaceful protest. But the reaction to that is that this morning there is an eight man lock on outside the, uh, the entrance to the Preston New Road well site. And, uh, you know, call it a hunch, I would say that um, the sort of video footage that uh, was put out on um, live stream yesterday, both on Facebook and on Bambooza, will actually draw more people into the, uh, the anti fracking campaign. And the police scored a massive own goal yesterday by arresting a very, very popular uh, local businessman. It's a, a gentleman by the name of John Tootill, 
who owns the nurseries uh, that are about half a mile uh, to the, uh, I guess it's to the west of um, the Preston New Road well site. This is the guy who's got you know, signs all outside his um, uh, property, his business, encouraging people to do their own research, to look at the dangers that uh, the fracking uh, will bring about. And, uh, you know, I guess that he's been a target. And yesterday, as the video footage will show, he was pushed three times by the police. And then, would you believe it, he was arrested for assault on a police officer. I believe the charge has been reduced to obstruction. But and, and of course, it won't come to court. If it does come to court, the charge will be thrown out as soon as the video footage is shown. But you know, this is this is what we're up against in terms of the corporate agenda. Right, uh, Ian, thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, report. And thank you also for really spelling out that in this case, the judge has uh, made the, the correct decision. This is one of the most important things, that when people do the right things, then public support should be in behind them. Uh, in contrast, when people are doing the wrong things, that brutality by the police, then the public needs to be jumping on that in a measured and uh, professional way. So if you feel like phoning or emailing the police, please do it. But make sure, of course, that you're polite and measured in what you say. Right. Let's take this on through what's happening in the system. We'll join the dots. Ian, I believe you can stay with us. So we'll bring you back into the news today. Let's have a look at this extraordinary BBC headline that there are going to be street parties to remembered uh, murdered MP Joe Cox. Um, so there's going to be thousands of street parties, picnics, baking competitions to be held on the 17th and 18th of June to remember this lady. Uh, her widower Brendan said the UK wide event called the Great Get Together would be a fitting tribute to the mother of two who died. I don't think anybody else has died on behalf of their country, Mike, in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. Her murder was designed to divide our country, apparently. So uniting in this way would be a powerful statement. And uh, we've even got the royal family jumping on board. So there's something very significant going on here. Uh, but when we get into it, what we're really seeing is that uh, this is the charity and third sector coming together. And uh, this is an event which I've called mesmerizing the public mind. So all of this focus on one woman who's died as if nobody else, with no disrespect to Joe Cox, but as if nobody else has died in support of their country. But when we get into the BBC detail, what do we find? Uh, well, let's bring this up on screen. This was the UK Columns um, analysis of David Cameron's Big Society. And uh, we did a diagram to show people how it all worked. Uh, the first project listed there as part of David Cameron's Big Society social economic agenda is called the Big Lunch. Uh, we did make a joke because, of course, the last thing that Eric Pickles needs is another big lunch. But taking the humour out of the uh, subject today, uh, we have to say interesting that the big lunch is actually backing this uh, whole event with Joe Cox. This is street theatre, Mike, in my opinion. Absolutely. And uh, let's remind people, uh, a lot of people think big society has disappeared. David Cameron has gone. Big society absolutely hasn't. Uh, this was some of the comments made around it. They, the charities in third sector, are the foundation of big society. He's not talking about it much, but they're playing an increasingly important role in modern Britain, to which the correct response is really who voted for that. Uh, but then uh, the paper, the Telegraph here, says if Cameron wants to turn his passion for social reform into reality and maintain some of our most valued services, then he needs uh, uh, to... Uh, he needs to conduct radical reform of the charity sector. Uh, so this is interesting stuff. Big society is big government. The lie is that it's nothing to do with big government. This is driving government to the lowest possible level levels of society. And what we've got going on here is the creation of a super socialist police state and Ian Crane just describing the sorts of behaviour we would expect to see in a police state, aggressive, brutalised policing. Um, well, is it just our imagination? Eric Pickles, what has this man said in the past? He says, uh, we are going to shake up the balance of power in this country. We're going to change the nature of the constitution 
be in no doubt about our commitment to localism. I know I look like an unlikely revolutionary, but the revolution starts here. So no mistake uh, in what we're looking at, this man boasting to the nation that uh, our Britain is to be broken apart for their new social agenda. And I'll run through this very quickly, but if you look at what these politicians have done, they've destroyed trust in MPs, they've destroyed trust in Parliament, they've injected the power of the EU, they've undermined the constitution and common law, they're in amongst families, morality, they're destroying faith, uh, they are reducing political debate, as we saw uh, in Parliament yesterday, to childish nonsense. Uh, the press and media are to be put under government control. That's Leveson. But this is the key bit. Local authorities partnered with the police, mental health, education, social services, charities, private corporations, all brought together. That is what big society is. And that is what this team have uh, created in order to take apart the fabric of this country. Now, Ian has discussed one dangerous precedent today. Let's look at another one. And this... Uh first glance, this seems like a small thing. Uh, this is Guardian article, Flogging Hell. Council plans to ban swearing in Rochdale. They're saying that the council leader is defending proposals to fine people £100 for using ab abusive language. Um, and obviously the usual suspects are saying this is a breach of human rights. Uh, Rochdale Borough Council is going to introduce what... Uh, a public spaces protection order. This is uh, the, the next generation uh, antisocial behaviour order. It's one of the, because ASBOs were split into uh, various different types of instrument and uh, public spaces protection orders is one of them. Uh, and it would lead to anyone caught using foul and abusive language being warned, moved on, given an on the spot fine. Uh, the Guardian saying, begging, loitering, antisocial parking, playing loud music, loud revving car engines, street drinking, authorised, unauthorised charity collections, uh, skateboarding would also be banned under the move, uh, and also a curfew for people under 18. They would not be allowed in the town centre between 11pm and seven and 6am. I believe I'm right in saying that was trialled out in Cornwall many years ago, 10 years ago, something like that. So. Okay, but, but what we're talking about here is, is the council now wanting to control be people's behaviour in a way that we've never seen before. And while many people may view that they don't want to go into the town centre and listening, listen to other people swearing or dropping litter or whatever it is, those are social issues which are not for the council to resolve. These are societal issues that we should be resolving as a community, not being imposed from the top by the council. Totally agree. Um, well, let's look at who's pushing this through. Here he is, Richard Farnell. Uh, well, he's in line for, as being described here, 51% rise. Uh, basically, what, what this, uh, uh, this is pay rise, what this uh, article is saying, that uh, Farnell currently receives a basic allowance of uh, £7,812 plus a special responsibility allowance. As leader of £23,412, that totals £31,224. But they're going to rise, raise the basic allowance for councillors by 34%. Uh, they're going to raise the Special Responsibility Alliance uh, and they're going to raise uh, various other alliances, uh, giving an, an overall pay rise of 51%. That's on top of his basic salary, um, so uh, which is already you know, obscene anyway. So perhaps this is why they need to bring this in to pay for this stuff. Uh, what did he have to say? I make no apologies for trying to make Rochdale a more welcoming place uh, for uh, people to enjoy. Uh, he said, uh, offensive and abusive behaviour is already an offence, but poli police resources are stretched in dealing with this low-level crime. We are working in partnership with them to use our powers to deal with this more effectively. And this is what this is all about. Power. It's, it's, well, it's about more powers being removed from the police and being put in the hands of private organisations. So, you know, this will not be down to, the, to, to council staff to deal with. This will be outsourced to a G4S or some other typical... Uh, security company to be patrolling the streets. Uh, we won't know whether we're being stopped by the police or by some private security firm. They're going to be handing out tickets as they see fit. And of course, it's for profit. And that's the key point here. But, uh, well, unfortunately, Pearl for now, uh, seems double to standards. Bit, a bit of a double standard here yeah. because this headline from uh, not too long ago, Rochdale Council Leader, 
Brand's political rival, a turd on Twitter. So there you go. He's not uh, too concerned about using unpleasant language himself when he feels like it. This is very serious. Ian, if we uh, just bring you back in on this for just a brief comment. This is very, very dangerous control of society. You've just mentioned the corralling of demonstrators. Well, that one seems to have been pushed to one side. Now we're going to have the local council telling us what we can say in public. Well, and once again, it'll be down to the judiciary to uphold the freedom of speech, freedom of expression. And as has been ruled in numerous cases, you know, swearing is is not a criminal offence. Um, abusive language directed at somebody is a different ball game. But you know, generic swearing uh, is, you know, one might argue, an unfortunate uh, part of uh, modern society. Um, but you know, nonetheless, the reality is, if the words are simply used in a generic sense, that's part of what you know, the free society is all about. You know, I made the observation um, on my uh, court submission that, um, you know, if, if what was being proposed was in Russia or uh, uh, Syria or Iran or North Korea, then, you know, the British media would be all over it like flies on the smelly stuff um, and using it as an example of how freedoms are being curtailed in these oppressive countries. But, you know, this is all smoke and mirrors, because obviously what we're seeing in this country is uh, effectively the push towards the corporatist state where anybody who either doesn't fit into the corporatist uh, agenda, i.e. the disabled or, the, or those who elect to live their lives on the fringes of society, you know, let's make sure that we pull all support away from them and they basically just go away and die. And, uh, you know, for, for even those who are able to contribute to the corporate estate, you know, when we're going to restrict dissent. And, you know, it starts by uh, limiting, obviously, free speech to protest zones. Then it moves on to limiting what you can actually say in public. And, you know, of course, it's uh, it's political correctness, uh, you know, just taken to a whole new level. Indeed. Well, that's one of the topics that I'll be speaking about at AV8. So we're going to get another chance to get into that. I'll just say here that the UK column has been warning and warning, consistently warning of the dangerous politicians that we've now got in Parliament. We need to get rid of these people. They are anti-British. They are anti our nation state. It doesn't matter what colour we are, white or black or yellow. These people are against anybody that's not in their club. And of course, the key to their agenda is Saul Alinsky research, that uh, campaigner, if you've never heard of him before. Well, the good news is people are definitely waking up. We've got another event coming up here on the 11th of March in Nottingham, uh, which is the Nottingham Wake Up Project meeting. So this is really local people now coming together to talk about what's really happening BBC, complete and utter waste of time, of course. So local people now putting, um, taking events in, in their own hands. This is really good to see. We've also got the Nottingham Conference coming up. Tickets are now starting to go quite quickly. If you haven't got a ticket for that, please get one. If we have a full hall of over 900 people, this is going to be really astonishing. Now, we can, uh, we can have a protest for the death of Joe Cox. We certainly don't want any protests for the death of the hundreds, thousands of children that have died uh, having been trafficked, prostituted or abused in UK. Certainly the British government doesn't want anything said for those uh, young victims. So I'll just uh, bring up this article. Thank you very much to the person who sent it to me, the County Gazette saying that something was very interesting was happening in Taunton because residents of a street had received a letter saying that the body of Jeanette Tate, uh, who's the schoolgirl who disappeared in 1978, was buried in one of the back gardens. And the anonymous letter accused the police of covering up. Now, on the right hand side of your screen is a tweet that I put out back in April. 2016, Devon and Cornwall Police very aggressive to new information coming forward from the mainstream media uh, and uh, hostile responses to the fact that somebody was trying to get the police to react to new evidence about Jeanette Tate and how did Devon and Cornwall Police respond warning off a mainstream journalist. 
Well, it's it's very strange stuff. Um, let's have a look at this, uh, which is where it gets interesting, because if we go back to the original um, time that Jeanette was portrayed in the press, uh, she was portrayed as an eight year old. The photograph in all of the posters, in all of the articles was of an eight year old girl when in fact Jeanette was 13 at the time and her appearance was center of the ringed photos there of a young girl. Now, many people have said there is something extremely strange about this. Photos of Jeanette as a 13 year old uh, were available, but none of the mainstream papers, none of the police posters portrayed her as that young teenager. They portrayed her as a little girl. Draw your own conclusions. Um, right. Now, last week we uh, mentioned that uh, today, uh, 9th of March, the Queen would be unveiling the Iraq and Afghanistan Memorial, honouring the duty and service of both UK armed forces and civilians, according to the Ministry of Defence. Uh, well, that happened uh, this morning. And uh, so here is uh, an image of uh, some musicians, uh, military musicians. So um, the Queen turned up in purple uh, to unveil this memorial. Here it is. Um, it was described by the artist as being two monoliths, uh, two white stones there, I believe, representing the Twin Towers, because that was basically 9-11 was the thing which brought us into those conflicts in the first place. Yeah. Um, and uh, so she unveiled this. And in the centre of the two monoliths, uh, the sun, perhaps? The black sun. I think uh, we're going to describe this for what it is. It's the black, the black sun between two pillars. And uh, I think this has got a totally different meaning from the one the public believe it has. Right. So, uh, the, so that black sun on one side uh, has uh, the, some soldiers on it portrayed. And on the other side, the artist was very keen to present that he had uh, decided to, to put on the, uh, on the other side of this disc uh, images portraying how we've uh, rebuilt Iraq uh, and Afghanistan since we murdered a million people in Iraq. And we'll say, Ian, just... Uh, no, just... Well, just before I bring <laughs> okay. you in on, on this, I just want to say I wondered very much whether Tony Blair would have the gall to turn up to this. And I have to say, he didn't surprise me because he did. So, Ian, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, what, what we're seeing right throughout the um, uh, ruling parasite classes is a total lack of social conscience. And, you know, it's almost a prerequisite now to function at that level of politics or industry uh, or in the police, of course, you know, to have zero social conscience. And, you know, what we, I was reminded of um, a comment that a friend of mine made 30 years ago. He was a career police sergeant and I asked him how he managed to get through each day. And he said, it's very simply and I simply leave my brain in the locker room when I put the uniform on. Well, it's getting to the point now where, you know, these people don't just leave their brains in the locker room, they leave their hearts. And, you know, the reality is that actually the more outrageous their behavior, then the faster the masses awaken. And, you know, it, it's like the old Star Trek um, analogy, you know, the Klingon ships before they could fire the shot that would destroy their enemies, they had to decloak. And this is what's going on right now. You know, this whole uh, edifice of parasites who are operating on behalf of, well, that's another debate, of course. But, you know, they are exposing themselves for what they are. And, you know, the reality is it is up to us because they rely on our apathy and our willful ignorance. And, you know, fortunately, an increasing number of people are reaching the point where they're saying, you know what, enough's enough. Yeah. And unless I get involved, then the legacy that we will be leaving future generations really doesn't bear thinking about. Uh, totally agree with that comment. Uh, well, let's come on to this. Uh, something's uh, definitely moving in the field of defence because after UK Column started to uh, warn people about the continued integration of uh, British military forces into a fully integrated European defence system, uh, with the French taking over the Brit British nuclear deterrent, ultimately control going to Germany, but also the setting up of a treasury, full um, research and development and military procurement. Uh, we've now finally got the Bruges group waking up and uh, highlighted here, this is what they had to say, anyone who thinks these plans 
This is the EU creation of full EU military integration. Anyone who thinks these plans won't affect the UK could be in for a nasty surprise. Well, we would say to that, actually, uh, the surprise is already in progress, but at least the Bruges group seems to be now paying attention to what the UK column is talking about. So well done them. Yes, well, just briefly, um, Theresa May is in Brussels today for the, uh, for the leaders summit there, 28 uh, leaders discussing migration, security, economic growth. They're also discussing the re-election of uh, Donald Tusk. Uh, the Polish do not want him re-elected because uh, uh, the ruling party in Poland despises him. Uh, so they don't want him re-elected. Um, and uh, they will also assess the implementation of the December 2016 conclusions on the external on external security and defence. So today they are assessing the progress towards military union. Uh, this is something already in progress. Uh, and uh, if you look at the well, we can we can uh, link to the document uh, from December 2016 where they where they're describing this. Um, they're also going to be later on discussing um, their preparations for the 60th anniversary of the European Union. So that's good. Theresa May, I think, isn't taking part in that particular discussion. Um, but uh, in the meantime, the noise continues in the media. Uh, this is the Telegraph. The EU is divided, fearful and in total disarray. There's just one thing the 27 agree on. And the one thing that they have decided that the 27 nations agree on is that they've got one thing to do, and that is to make sure that Britain absolutely pays for leaving the EU. So behind this noise, this distraction, uh, this sense this sense within the media, this, this impression that the media continues to try to give that we are leaving the European Union, yep. of course, further integration continues. So it's, it's even worse than people think because not only are we not leaving, that Brexit is a complete and utter lie, we're going to pay for the privilege of not leaving. Yes. And uh, I think we've already paid because EU policy is largely destroyed the United Kingdom. All we need to do is get rid of the EU, uh, and I mean get rid of it properly, and we can start to rebuild this country. Politicians have got to go as well, but in the nicest appropriate way. Uh, Ian, thank you very much for joining us. Extremely good news about your court case. One sentence before we close. Well, listen, I think that uh, everybody agrees that we've got to you know, get more and more people involved. And, and I'm really looking forward to your event in uh, Nottingham in April because, uh, you know, you, you've asked me to address the issue of community activism. And, and, and grassroots activism is the way in which we need to bring about systemic change. Get involved and not relying on others, you know, who are quite probably in many cases controlled opposition. Let's get involved ourselves. Yeah, brilliant. Well, that brings us to the end of today's news. I think we're really starting to get to grips with what is going on in the uh, United Kingdom. Don't bother listening to BBC or the other mainstream news. Uh, watch UK Column, check what we tell you, do your own research. And if you like what we're doing, please uh, pass the UK Column name on to friends, neighbours and as many other people as you can. If you're not already a subscriber, We'd uh, ask you to consider subscribing or donating because at the end of the day, we can only do what we do with your help. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.